20. And separately, we can add to the list, the Department for Education has confirmed it had an office gathering on December the 10th, 2020, to thank staff for their work during the pandemic. And the Department for Transport also apologised after confirming reports of a party on its premises on December the 16th that year. Let's talk to Alistair Campbell, uh, former Director of Communications for uh, Labour, under Tony Blair, of course. Alistair Campbell, uh, quite a list there of uh, parties or alleged parties. I mean, the government's position is wait for Sue Gray to uh, finish her inquiry. And, and maybe we should do that. Well, we've had plenty of these sorts of situations before where they hide behind inquiries. Then as soon as the inquiry comes along, Boris Johnson decides to accept it if it endorses what he said before and, and reject it if he hasn't. I think the facts in this one are pretty clear uh, in relation to him. He either did go to this event or he didn't. That email is either real or it's not. Uh, and I think that the, the problem I think I have is that this thing goes ahead now is that you have to remember Boris Johnson has put himself as the sole arbiter of the ministerial code and he's now put a civil servant in a position where, in a sense, she has to decide whether or not he stays as prime minister. Because, frankly, if he did break his own law in relation to COVID restrictions, his position is untenable. He has to go. And I honestly think that the... I mean, I've been very surprised the reluctance of the police to get involved in any way in all of the previous situations that, as you say, have been exposed, where it clearly suggests that there was a culture within Downing Street that the rules do not apply to us. Uh, I think the police have to get involved now, uh, because you talk, you're talking about a, you know, a, you talk about a crime in the Garden of Downing Street. I mean, it's, it's incredible to be saying that, but that's true. In terms of voters, I mean, this cuts through, doesn't it? Because they were all, you know, well, the vast majority were obeying the restrictions, which were pretty onerous at that time in May of 2020. And, and we actually heard, we've heard emotional testimony from many people who've lost loved ones, including a, a DUP MP in the Commons today, talking about losing his, his mother-in-law. But Michael Ellis, the, the Paymaster General, was in the Commons defending the government and saying the Prime Minister is not going anywhere. Well, the Prime Minister certainly won't, won't want to go anywhere because he'll cling on as, as long as he can. And part of Boris Johnson's personality is that he likes getting into scrapes to see if he can get out of them. And meanwhile, the serious business of government just gets pushed to one side. And also, I don't, I don't frankly care whether it cuts through or it doesn't. What I care about is the fact that we have a government and a prime minister that are meant to abide by the principles of public life, honesty, openness, objectivity, selfless, integrity, accountability and leadership. And he does not. That is more important to me. So I think that the fact that the, the Tory MPs keep saying, oh, this isn't bothering the public and the public don't care about this. One, I think the public do care about this. But two, that to me is not the most important point. The most important point is whether we have as a government a prime minister and a cabinet and ministers and MPs who are there for the public interest rather than for their own and who have rules that they abide by and who are not above the law, which I'm afraid this suggests they think they are. And, and as we've said, the government strategy is just to, to wait and see what the Sue Gray comes up with with this inquiry. But the, the trouble is there are more questions, but there are also potentially there's going to be more of a drip drip of, of allegations, of stories, potentially even pictures as well of, uh, of the parties we know about, maybe even parties we don't know about. Well, somebody said yesterday, just imagine what lies and, and, and evidence of corruption that we don't yet know about in relation to the government. I think that's true. And also, because Johnson tends to try to find somebody to throw under the bus, uh, that does not make for a workplace where people feel that they're valued and respected and trusted. I know lots of people are leaving the civil service because they just cannot stand what this government is becoming the way that these people operate. And so I suspect that, yes, there will be that drip, drip, drip. And when you're in this sort of situation, the best and, in fact, the only thing I think you can do really is actually to stand up and set the situation out as it was and things as they are now. And the thing is, I don't think that's the way he operates. And so I don't expect that to happen. 
I think he'll probably go along to Prime Minister's questions tomorrow. He'll probably sort of mumble some kind of apology about the upset that people feel, as opposed to what he and others have done. And he'll then, as you say, try to hide behind Sue Gray's inquiry. Now, I know Sue Gray very, very well. She was a civil servant when I worked for, the, for worked in Downing Street, and she's somebody, you know, who I think does embody public service the way that Johnson and his cabinet, frankly, simply do not. But he has put her in an utterly invidious position. And I do think, actually, this now will become and should become a matter for the police. I mean, were you his director of uh, communications? I appreciate that's not a very likely scenario. But what, what, what advice would you be giving him at the moment? Because, for example, he wasn't in the Commons today for that urgent question. Um, uh, and lots of people were saying he should have been. Uh, Michael Ellis, the paymaster general, was there instead. I mean, should he, is it a better strategy just to talk openly about this? <laughs> ben, you really are asking the wrong person because, as you rightly say, uh, he wouldn't have me, and if he <laughs> asked me, I would. I, I just simply couldn't do. Um, look, I think I think uh, it's it's very very difficult for him now. But this is the inevitable consequence, I think, of the fact that the country elected as prime minister somebody whilst knowing that this was the sort of person that he was. And you know, it's not as if there wasn't plenty of evidence beforehand about his dishonesty, about his lack of attention to detail about his lack of team spirit and so forth, and all the qualities that you need actually to run an organisation as major and as important as a government. Um, so I don't know what I would say to him, frankly, because, you know, one, I wouldn't be there, and two, I'd be very, very surprised that he'd listen, because, you know, it's interesting that he talked about Downing Street being a tip. Um, I think he probably does consider it to be a bit of a tip, because I think that's the way that he operates. I think he's, he's, his life is chaotic. He is chaotic. And, you know, I've said before in your programme, we have the worst possible prime minister at the worst possible time. Um, and honestly, the only party I think most of the country are looking forward to now is the one that held, that's held when he's gone and takes his whole rotten crew with him. Um, uh, Martin Reynolds was the prime minister's principal private secretary who, who sent out this invitation. Um, uh, and Downing Street said the prime minister still got confidence in him. What, what should happen to him? I mean, and also, what do you think about in that email? He was saying, hi, all after what's been an incredibly busy period. We thought it'd be nice to make the most of the lovely weather and have some socially distanced drinks. In other words, we've all been working very hard. We deserve a bit of, bit of um, you know, a, a few drinks in the garden. That was, that was the sort of message. Um, but what should be happening to him specifically because, you know, that email was from him? Well, I don't believe for one minute that any senior civil servant, and I mean, I don't know, I don't think I know Martin Reynolds, but I assume that, you know, he must be hopefully one of the brightest and one of the best because that's the people that you would like to think are working in Downing Street. I don't know him. Uh, I do think that to put that down in print at that time is pretty extraordinary. However, I think that is a consequence of him thinking that that is what his boss would have wanted. I don't believe that a, a, a principal private secretary would have written such a thing uh, without having checked with his or her boss that that was OK to do. I just don't accept. I can't see that happening in any set of circumstances. Um, I suspect what might happen to him is that Johnson will try to alight upon him as the guy to throw under the bus. Um, uh, or he might try to you know, promote him off to some other job somewhere. I don't know, frankly. But I really do think this is, you know, we, we are in a parliamentary democracy. We elect a government through the people that we elect to parliament. This, in the end, is about the prime minister and ministers. They set the tone for government. Uh, so I think it would be entirely wrong if people thought that just by getting rid of a few civil servants, somehow... This is OK. It's not. Alistair Campbell, uh, good to talk to you. I appreciate your time today. Thank, Thank you. you very much for being with us.